morning. We are going to start a meeting today for the Lyon County Board of County Commissioners, Thursday, March 21st, 2024. It is nine o'clock exactly. The agenda today, all action will be taken on items unless otherwise noted. No action will be taken on any item until it is properly agendized. To avoid meeting disruptions, please place cell phones and beepers in the silent mode or turn them off during the meeting. The board reserves the right to take items in a different order to accomplish business in the most efficient manner. Items may be combined for consideration. Items may be pulled or removed from the agenda at any time. Restrictions on comments by the general public. Any such restriction must be reasonable, may restrict the time, place, and manner of the comments, but may not restrict comments based upon viewpoint. The board of County Commissioners convening as other boards. The members of the Board of County Commissioners also serve as the Liquor Board, Central Lion Vector Control District Board, Mason Valley Mosquito Abatement District Board, Walker River Weed Control District Board, Willow Creek General Improvement District Board, the Silver Springs General Improvement District Board, and during this meeting may convene as any of those boards as indicated on this or a separately posted agenda. And this meeting may break between 11.30 and 1.30 for lunch. Roll call today, all commissioners are in chambers. And item number two, invocation will be given by Andrew Montgomery of the Faith Baptist Church. All those rise, please. Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather as uh, a people together. And we thank you for the commissioners who have risen to the task of guiding and directing the county. We pray that you give them wisdom today direct their uh, thoughts and their actions to best represent those who have voted for them and to best protect the rights and uh, the uh, properties of those that have put them in the office. We pray these things for your wisdom and in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Hendricks, would you please lead us in the pledge? The pledge of of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item four public participation. No action will be taken on any item until it's properly agendized. It's anticipated that public participation will be held at this time, though it may be returned to at any time during the agenda. Citizens wishing to speak during public participation are asked to state their name for the record and will be limited to three minutes. The board will conduct public comment after discussion of each agenda action item, but before the board takes any action. Do I have any public participation? Morning. Yes, Staff sir. For Mason Valley Fire. Yes. Um, I'm not sure Sheriff Polk has given an update on Miller and Iazzi Lanes. But it's been about three months since you guys took action on that, and we've had zero wrecks. So I wanted to say what you did was a success, and thank you all for the support. It's working. Oh, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Any other public participation? Seeing none, we will then move on to... Uh... Action item here for item five, uh, review and adoption of agenda. Do you have any commissioner changes or comments? Do we have any public input? Seeing none, I will request a motion to, re to adopt the agenda. Chairman Hockaday, I'll make a motion that we approve the agenda. Second. Okay. So motion by Commissioner Jacobson and second by Commissioner Keller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. <clears throat> we have a time certain 9 o'clock, which we are now 9.04. Time certain at 9 a.m. for presentation only. Presentation from the University of Nevada, Reno's University Center for Economic Development on the Economic Impact of Boys and Girls Club, Mason Valley's Night in the Country Music Festival. You're up. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick Beaton, Boys and Girls Clubs of Mason Valley, Director of Development for the Record. Um, as you all know, we do this little event every year called Night in the Country. 
We last had an economic impact study done by the university in 2017 um, that reflected about a seven and a half million dollar area economic impact. Things have changed for our event significantly over the last seven years. Um, so we asked Mr. Fred Steinman over here to come down and, and do another economic impact report during our 2013 festival. He is here to share the results with us. So with that, I'll give Fred the floor. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Fred Steinman, Director of the University Center for Economic Development at the College of Business, University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be here this morning to share with you the results of a comprehensive economic impact assessment of the 2023 Night in the Country event. A uh, short presentation, but also in your packets, you should have a copy of University Center for Economic Development Technical Reports 2023-24-04, an economic impact assessment of the 2003 Night in the Country event. Uh, this brick uh, of a USED technical report uh, provides a comprehensive summary of all of the work that we did as part of this economic impact assessment. Uh, that includes a comprehensive summary and analysis of both the on-site as well as post-event survey work uh, that we did uh, with graduate students from the University of Nevada, Reno, as well as with Dr. Tom Harris, uh, past director of the center, um, and then also an examination of a variety of socio-demographic and economic data that we were able to collect uh, on individual attendees of the 2023 events. The work that we did in terms of data collection of both the on-site as well as post-event surveys and then incorporation of the socio-demographic and economic data was used to build what we call an input, output, or I.O. model. Uh, the input-output model is used in economic impact assessments really to measure four individual components. First and foremost is the direct impact uh, that a specific economic event like Night in the Country has on a community or a region. Uh, then we use the input-output analysis to measure both the indirect and induced impacts indirect impacts being largely the business to business transactions that occur. Uh, so you may have a vendor at night in the country who is selling goods and services to attendees, but they need to buy supplies. Uh, so they will, in essence, support other businesses further down the supply chain. And then the induced impacts are those dollars that individuals who are working the events uh, are earning and then spending on other businesses and services as well. The multipliers are used to essentially ascertain the direct, indirect, and induced impacts that occur throughout a local and a regional economy because of those new dollars that are essentially pumped into a local area because of a major event such as Night in the Country. Uh, and then again, of course, all this work uh, is uh, summarized in the technical report that you have before you. Uh, just to kind of go quickly through some of the major key results, again, it's a, about a 200-ish page technical report. Uh, we know you have a busy day, so I certainly don't want to go page by page. Uh, but one of the things that we found in terms of the survey work that we did both on-site and follow-up is that really the majority of survey respondents are relatively young. This is an event that essentially attracts individuals of income earning as well as spending age to the community. Uh, which is perfect, right? That's exactly what we want to see in terms of the economic impact of attracting individuals who are earning incomes and then don't have a problem spending that income uh, when they attend special events. Uh, another positive observation, uh, about 76% of event attendees based upon the survey work, as well as mining some of the online ticket survey data that the Boys and Girls Club were able to provide us, are coming from outside of Lyon County. Uh, and again, that's another thing that we want to see with these types of events. We don't necessarily want to see just local spending local dollars in the economy. That's great to keep local dollars local, but we really want to see that flow of cash from individuals outside a region bringing those dollars into the community and then purchasing goods and services and taking those goods and services home with them. 
Uh, one thing that we actually saw that uh, was a significant improvement from the previous economic impact study done a decade plus ago uh, was an increased level of extended stay by attendees. Uh, so not only are attendees of Night in the Country in 2023 attending Night in the Country and staying for the most part the entire event, uh, but they're adding a day or two uh, to their visit to uh, the northern and northwestern Nevada region. Uh, we kind of see that in terms of attendees saying that, hey, in addition to coming to see Night in the Country, uh, I may come back or extend my stay, you know, to attend other events in the northwestern Nevada uh, region. Uh, certainly Best in the West uh, Nugget Rip Cookoff, the Reno Rodeo, uh, the uh, Reno Balloon Races, and various beer and wine events like the Wine Walk that is held in downtown Reno, uh, but also Wine Walks held in Minden and Gardnerville, Carson City are all events that these individuals indicated that they were attending, uh, which again is great, you know, bringing in so many individuals from other parts of the country and having them stay or return to the Northwestern Nevada region is just an additional way that this event, Night in the Country, really benefits not only the local economy here in Yarrington, not only the countywide economy of Lyon County, uh, but really the entire regional economy of the Northwestern Nevada re region. Uh, and of course, one other thing that we did see, uh, which is significantly important, uh, is relatively high income earners are attending night in the country. Uh, there's probably a bit of a self-selection bias there, uh, especially in 2023 when gas prices were expensive. Uh, it takes higher income individuals to an, attend an event like this. Uh, but again, for the most part, uh, Night in the Country is really attracting a younger demographic and a demographic that has relatively high incomes. Uh, in terms of essentially where people are from, in terms of the participants attending Night in the Country, uh, not surprisingly, a good portion of them are coming from other Nevada counties. Uh, but in terms of the top 10 counties of estimated attendee or origination, uh, we also see a high number of attendees from Sacramento County, Placer County, and El Dorado County in California, which is, again, absolutely ideal if you're in northwestern Nevada because you're bringing in individuals from outside the state to pour their dollars into the local and regional economy. Uh, again, not surprising that Nevada and California were one and two in terms of states with the highest number of attendees. Uh, but we are also seeing, you know, far and wide attendance from other states, uh, Colorado, Florida, and Arizona essentially rounding up the top five. Uh, but as you'll see in the individual technical report, there were 20 plus other states uh, that had at least one individual who lives there attend night in the country. Uh, and one thing that we did see um, in the socio-demographic and economic data of those various counties and states where other individuals are coming from, uh, those uh, counties and states typically have relatively low median ages and relatively high per capita median household and median family income. So again, really is targeting a demographic you know, that is just absolutely ideal to really prime an economic engine. Um, in terms of the actual input output analysis, uh, our model is based upon largely what we saw in terms of the on-site uh, as well as post-event uh, attendee survey, where we essentially asked individuals to tell us how much during their trip tonight in the country they spent in a variety of spending categories. Uh, probably not surprising, uh, the uh, ones highlighted in blue uh, are the ones that had uh, both the highest per attendee spending levels, as well as overall total spending. Uh, certainly, uh, event and associated fees, you know, that includes all the tag-alongs, uh, in addition to just purchasing the tickets very high, but still generating significant economic impact for the region. Uh, lodging, uh, over $4 million total. Food and beverage, not at night in the country, a little over $5 million, uh, which is, again, fantastic, because that's telling us that not only are individuals spending money on site for food and beverage, but they're actually leaving the event at times to go buy food and beverage at the grocery store or local regional restaurants. Uh, again, really diffusing that economic impact throughout the entire uh, region. Uh, 
Uh, and then again, as I kind of alluded to, given where we were uh, in the summer of 2023, relatively high levels of inflation, you know, which triggered relatively high fuel prices, uh, that really pushed up uh, average uh, per person attendee spending, as well as total spending on fuel and transportation. Uh, gas and diesel was just really expensive. Uh, it's usually really expensive in the summer uh, to begin with. It's high travel season, but add in additional inflationary pressures and that kind of artificially inflates the numbers. That said, it's still economic impact, right? It's still dollars being spent uh, by individuals of a relatively high median per capita uh, household and uh, family income levels. Uh, to really just kind of summarize and give you the high level overput of our estimated overall economic impacts, uh, the total overall economic impact when we add up direct, indirect, and induced impacts, a uh, little over $25 million. Not bad for a four, three, four day uh, event. Uh, really placing night in the country in kind of the middle tier of major regional events uh, that occur in the Northwestern Nevada region over the calendar year. Uh, really actually coming very close to the estimated economic impacts of the Green Reno uh, balloon races, as well as uh, the uh, uh, air show and uh, air, uh, national air championship races. Um, so again, uh, about $25.3 million in total uh, economic impact of which about 17.3 million was direct. Uh, that's just dollars that individuals pumped uh, into the local and regional economy. Uh, that level of economic impact uh, generated uh, approximately 234 total jobs, uh, some of those part-time, some of those full-time, again, hard to sort out the FTE, if you will, and how long-standing and permanent those positions were. Uh, but again, total direct jobs created uh, to satisfy the surge in demand uh, was about 200 uh, with indirect uh, new jobs created about 16 and total induced uh, about 15 to 16. Uh, this also has obviously uh, public uh, tax revenue implications uh, when you're pumping into this amount of money into a local and regional economy in short order. Uh, we estimated, uh, based upon the results of the input-output analysis, that the 2023 Night in the Country event generated a little over $6 million uh, in total tax revenue. Uh, you know, that's sales, property, business license, uh, just kind of everything thrown together. Uh, we do have that kind of broken down uh, in terms of the estimation of, you know, different taxing entities. Uh, for the county itself, uh, the county collected an estimated $451,000 in the three or four days of night in the country. Uh, the state, because of the way sales and other tax rates are structured, uh, certainly put its hand in your pocket a little more than others at $1.7 million. Uh, and federal tax revenue, which is income tax revenue, again, individual businesses have to pay federal income tax, as well as individual employees who are earning that no, new income, uh, collected about $3.7 million uh, in total tax revenue. Uh, but overall, uh, going back to the previous uh, economic impact assessment done a decade plus ago, uh, we really have seen a significant increase uh, in the overall economic impact, impact of night in the country. Uh, and that's really consistent with looking at how the event has grown and evolved. Uh, and has really become not just a regional event, but a national and even to a degree, uh, an international event, uh, recruiting and bringing uh, attendees uh, from across the world to, uh, to Lyon County. Uh, I know I went through that relatively fast. Uh, I know we have a busy day, but more than happy to answer any questions that you may have about the uh, results of the study. Uh, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. What's a sub county? Uh, sub county are uh, like the general improvement district or you know the uh, fire district um, individual sub entities uh, within the county uh, that would also likely include city of Arrington, uh, potentially city of Fernley as well um, so but kind of taxing jurisdictions within the county that aren't the county that was what I thought I just wanted to make sure I was right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jacobson. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman Hockaday. I really appreciate your report. Um, it seems uh, like this type of information, um, where will you all share this? Is uh, So the technical report gets published through the University Center for Economic Development and through the U.S. Economic Development Administration. So a copy of this gets filed with the Library of Congress, uh, but we provided copies to the Night in the Country and the Boys and Girls Club we'll be sharing as well. Yeah, as I say, the full technical report will be available on our website, <clears throat> bgcmasonvalley.org, um, probably sometime tomorrow. Right. Um, and where, I guess where I was going with this, uh, Chairman Hockaday, is this seems like um, this could be shared probably. Um, I know uh, Lyon County does an econ summit for our students. Uh, that uh, took you 10 minutes. 12 minutes. I think something like this could be shared uh, with all the youth and the econ and what a, what a great presentation uh, to kind of give kids our, our Lyon County residents or students or residents um, a short presentation at the beginning of that would be fantastic for those kids. Uh, this was incredible. And then my second thing I, I noticed when I was reading through this report um, the tax revenue I see is up there and it was on, I believe it's on page 41, uh, some of that, but just the amount of taxes <laughs> that every of every, if which way North and South we get hammered on taxes. I get that, but, uh, it's just, it's amazing what, what kind of revenue, um, is sent and the generates for, for local state and federal. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, but again, I want to thank you. That was, I really enjoyed reading through this and, and, uh, your presentation today was spot on short, sweet, and to the point. Thank you, sir. I do also want to clarify one point on, on one of the previous slides that showed almost $18 million in event associated fees. Just so everybody knows that does not mean that we're collecting $18 million. <laughs> sales. Um, that is obviously a multiplier, multiplier and everything, right? So, you know, with merch, tickets, um, alcohol sales, all that, all in told, we hope to hit about $4 million every year on an event that costs about $3.4, $3.5. So just to, we're, we are not making $18 million on time in the country. <laughs> Any further comments? So I just want to say that's a, really a, a phenomenal briefing, very quick and to the point. Uh, I too agree with uh, Commissioner Jacobson. This is the type of information we need to get out to the county so that they know uh, the tremendous economic impact that it has on Lyon County. Um, because I, I didn't know that these were the type of figures that we're looking at with uh, Night in the Country. And uh, it's a real eye opener. People need to understand what a, a great uh, boon it is to the county to have this type of an activity and this type, type of income. So thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> One more thing, because the new site, the Grange, is fully 100% on city land. Um, so I did just want to thank the county as a whole, right? We'll continue, obviously, to work with everybody, everybody, but not quite to the, the full, finer detail. So thank you to the county for the last 23 years of support mm -hmm. as we were on some split land out there at the fairgrounds. It, it means a lot and it helped make it possible. So thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Guys. Excellent uh, presentation with uh, number seven, presentation of awards and a recognition of accomplishments. Do we have anything for item seven today? If not, we'll move on to item eight, commissioner reports and county manager reports. Uh, let's start with Commissioner Hendricks today. I attended my first Dayton Valley Con Conservation District board meeting and um, I knew it was going to be a little bit hairy when two days before the meeting, I get a notice that the manager is uh, giving notice, two weeks notice, and they definitely have their challenges, but the whole board stayed late and worked really hard to determine a clear path forward, and I look forward to having that board get completely straightened out. Um, I attended the NACO Public Lands and Natural Resources workshop on best practices for industrial solar and did get a lot of information from that. We don't have yet our best practices. We have 
we'll have another meeting in June, but a lot of people are really putting in some effort to try and get that right for every county. And last night I attended the Carson Water Subconservancy District. And uh, Ed James did mention that the state engineer is putting together a group to finalize what they're gonna do on the Humboldt River. And they wanna use that as a model for what they do with the Carson River. Mm. So I suggested to Andrew that we do our best to get someone from Lyon County on that board. That's it. Uh, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really don't have much to report because I've been playing hooky down in Las Vegas, watching really tall people play basketball. So <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Keller. I too, too attended the Carson Water Subconservancy District meeting last night. Uh, it was a little enlightening, mm -hmm. um, to say the least. Uh, also uh, attended the workshop on renewable, the NACO workshop. I actually uh, moderated it for the renewable energy development and the county perspective. And I believe that's supposed to be online for any commissioner that didn't attend so they could get some information. And that's it. Uh, commissioner Jacobson. Thank you, Chairman Hockaday. Uh, attended the Fernley City Council meeting. Um, appreciated uh, some of their recognition they passed out last night. Uh, met with reps from Nextera Energy. Um, and discuss some of the Green Link project and the um, some of their d details and what they're looking to do in the future. Um, shared with them my concern about, I believe it's close to 4,000 acres uh, being used for some of that project, their projects or their plans, um, which is my, mainly a BLM ground so we don't have a whole lot of control i guess but um and then i'd like to thank those uh county uh groups and local businesses for their upcoming participation uh at the career fair uh college career fair at, at fernley high school i think it's important that we continue to stress being a productive citizen um to our kids um and I uh, just want to put on everyone's radar that uh, being on the board for the Friendly Boys and Girls Club that on April 27th, we're, ho there, we're hosting an event there in Fernley that should be a very good time um, and a, uh, a fundraiser, probably not to the extent of the Mason Valley Boys and Girls Club. If we hit $27 million, I will I'll do the gritty, all right? So I don't think you have to worry about me dancing. <laughs> With that, that's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I attended the Smith Valley Park Board, and uh, there's quite a quite a group that attended. Um, a lot of discussion about the arena and getting soil. In fact, we have an agenda item to uh, approve today for getting uh, a load of safer soil into the arena or as they call a uh, high speed running of horses and cattle. Um, of course, my normal agenda meeting uh, where we get to set up the agenda. I also I was on Zoom for the renewable energy meeting uh, <clears throat> with presentations by the BLM about energy and uh, the governor's office of energy. And of course, that was uh, run by Commissioner Keller. A lot of good information and some pointers on what we need to be looking for in the future for energy tax abatement and also projects that are become, coming our way and what we have to say about them. Also had uh, the local emergency planning committee, and we just discussed uh, grant proposals and approved uh, going forward with those grant proposals and that was pretty much uh, my extra activities for the last week or so so i will look at the county manager here and listen uh, to uh, what uh, he has uh, to uh, say uh, yeah i was gonna say i don't, I don't know why the putting is so so close up here <laughs> it makes it easy that, to tell that's a that's a lecture yeah oh that's, that's a lecture a all right andrew haskin line for the record um so last time I talked a little bit about the CPF request, the, uh, the notification that we got from 
uh, Congressman Amade's office for the two point, uh, just under two point six million dollars for the sewer project in Dayton. Well, when I got back to my office after the meeting, I got an email from the Senate side about the two point two million dollars uh, um, that we had requested for the reconstruction and redesign of the corner of Miller and Iaz. And so that is working its way through, or or it's been approved. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. It's either way, it's very close, uh, and that is expected to move forward here pretty quick. They let us know that uh, that we they would reach out and put more details on how to proceed once that was all done. So pretty excited about that. That takes us up to just under two uh, four point eight million dollars there on uh, federal uh, federal appropriations for Lyon County. So really excited about that and really looking forward to getting to work on those projects. So um, something I wanted to let the board know, um, the contract for the indigent defense is up this year and the current contractor notified us that uh, what they would like to do is uh, split it out into three contracts like it was previously um, with one contract covering the Dayton area, one contract covering the Fernley area and then one contract covering uh, Walker River area. And so um, Mr. Foley and myself have been working um, working on that uh, and um, we uh, expect to bring back more information to the board shortly. We'll likely have to do an RFP for one of those, but two uh, the uh, attorney groups have notified us that they're interested in continuing to move forward with their respective areas because the way it was set up before the, well, it was one to one law firm, they had attorneys and each area so it would kind of split up and so we're working through that and uh, I will, will keep you posted expect to see um, some more information shortly um, so I heard several board members talk about solar projects or, or different meetings regarding solar um, I actually had two meetings yesterday with solar companies uh, um, that were interested in Lyon County um, you know, with GreenLink coming through, that transmission um, infrastructure is vital for for various renewable energy projects. And so I'm currently working, um, I've, I've got some ideas on how to address this, to how, how to minimize uh, impacts to Lyon County and the residents of Lyon County. Um, I, you know, I don't know that we can fully stop all of the projects, and I'm not sure that we would want to, but, uh, um, you know, how do we, how do we, manage that uh, and make sure that uh, you know we don't just see solar uh, solar fields every time we, we drive out on the public lands uh, and so um i'll be, I'll be working through that uh, and i'll I'm look forward to bring back some of those ideas uh, um to the board and as we move forward um another thing that came to my attention so um i i'm going to be bringing an item to the board here to have a discussion about uh, the community development fees. Um, so typically the philosophy uh, in the past with the board has been that development should pay for itself. Uh, and so sticking with that, uh, we haven't raised uh, our fees in the community development department really uh, since 2016. And then looking at it, well, we had a lot of growth last year. Um, the department fell about $900,000 short uh, of meeting that goal. Of, uh, development paying for development. And so um, about 700,000 of that was actually on the planning side, uh, but the rest was on the building side. And so Mr. Foley and I did an, al an analysis on that while we were um, looking at budgetary stuff. And so I want to um, at least have that discussion and get the board's appetite for what it would look like to adjust those fees um, moving forward. And then speaking of um, community development. I'm excited to announce that we did hire a new community development director who will be starting on April 8th. Uh, and so I look forward to introducing you to him. Uh, it's uh, April 8th actually happens to be the budget meeting. So uh, I'll introduce him there. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Kevin. Are you locally or? Locally. <laughs> Uh, locally being Lyon County. So that's what my speaker's not on. So on a lot of the solar stuff, when you bring it back and everything else, maybe a more comprehensive look at it too, as far as uh, with the uh, NV Energy being able to do their own solar fields now, 
are any of these actually going to come to life, even though we go through this uh, activity, because it might take them six years to get on board. And by then they might not even be eligible to be on the line of transmission lines. Mm -hmm. So I, I really want to look at that. Uh, and also on some of these abatements, you mentioned abatements, may, is there a way that we can move forward with uh, some form of, uh, can we not take over the utilities of projects when they dedicate it to the county until the abatements run out? Um, and all, that be under county code? All things that, that I, I would have to look into and that certainly uh, could be part of a broad discussion. Thank you. Commissioner Jacobson, anything? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we're on number nine, elected official reports, 9A for report only. Our Canal Township uh, information in your packet. And we have Sheriff Pope. You're ready to go. Oh, Brad Pope, Lyon County Sheriff for the record. I wasn't going to give a report, but a couple of things came up. So, uh, Miller and Iazi, uh, Chief Trapers, right? We haven't had any accidents. However, our uh, dummy police car was extremely vandalized and uh, it's going to be removed. So, mm -hmm. it'd be kind of an experiment to see if the, uh, the police car was slowing people down before the curb or the, uh, the stop signs are working. So, uh, stand by for that. Uh, as far as Night in the Country goes, uh, the Boys and Girls Club reached out and asked that the Sheriff's Office uh, head up the law enforcement for the event this year due to the uh, City of Arrington Police Department being a little bit of disarray with no chief. And uh, planning starts right now. Uh, for the first time in a while, the Boys and Girls Club will compensate the Sheriff's Office under a contract for heading up the law enforcement uh, for that event. So We'll be presenting a contract to you eventually uh, with what that details. So just want to give you a heads up on that. That's all I have to report. Um, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Have you noticed any reduction in the driver's speed on Miller and Iazi, or, or are they still a lot of um, excessive speeding going on? Oh, there's mm -hmm. still excessive speeding, mm -hmm. but, but they are slowing down before that curve. So the accidents are avoided, but the, uh, the speeding is... It's obviously still a problem. Um, took my wife out for a ride on that road, 30 miles an hour is extremely painful. Uh, she asked me never to take her on that road again. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so having that sentiment, people are, they're still obsessed with speed, Miller, Piazzi, Pete Henders, that, uh, that entire area. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, Commissioner Keller. Uh, one of the things, but as night in the country gets even better and better, I hope it grows and grows. But uh, the the traffic in Silver Springs, you really need a lot of uh, effort up in that area when that lets out, right? Because they trickle in, but they all leave at the same time. And Ramsey Week's cut off and every, everything. And we're getting people from out of the area attending, and they don't really know what they're what they're doing. So we can use all the help we can up in that area. So that'll be part of the planning uh, when we start talking to NDOT about traffic control. And that's something we'll mention uh, to the Boys and Girls Club for, club for the planning uh, aspect of this is not to just focus on this immediate area, but other traffic congestion areas that are affected by it, which does include Silver Springs, around about Ramsey Weeks, uh, basically the whole 95, 50 corridor there. So. Anything further? All right. Thank you, sir. Appointed official reports. Any appointed officials want to talk today? A lot of quiet people today. Number 11, advisory board reports. No? Oh, okay. Um, I don't see any hands on Zoom, and I don't see anybody jumping up for that either. Okay, we'll move down to item 12, consent agenda. Action will be taken on all items. All matters listed under the consent agenda are considered routine and may be acted upon by the Board of County Commissioners with one action and without an extensive hearing. Any member of the board or any citizen may request that an item be taken from the consent agenda discussed and acted upon separately during this meeting. So, commissioners, anything? Commissioner Jacobson. Thank you, Chairman Hockday. I'd like to pull 12E. Echo, 12E. Okay. 
All right, uh, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to pull items 12 J, K, and L. It's marked here. And the, okay, anything further? Any public input? Seeing none, uh, looks like we're going to have a motion for 12A through 12A, excluding 12E, J, K, and L. And I have a motion on that. Chair sure. Hockaday, I'll make a motion that we approve the con consent agenda uh, 12A through 12L, pulling 12E, 12J, 12K, and 12L for Second. further discussion. Second. Okay. A motion by Commissioner Jacobson and a second by Commissioner Henderson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, that motion passes 5 0. Let's move on to 12 E for possible action. Approve a memorandum of understanding with the Lyon County School District for the Sheriff's Office to provide school resource officers and the school district to provide. 360000 in funding for fiscal year 2025. Thank you, Chairman Hockaday. Um, if I may, um, this I don't I don't have, really have a ton on this, but thank you, Sheriff, for stepping up. Um, I'm just worried about burnout of the SRO um, in the Fernley area, especially being it's a large, large population um, of students and uh so i'm just curious if there's plans to to look at um building that um uh sro any uh, with size in the future um because i know that uh the sro does a great job of building relationships with those kids and 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 keeping kids safe and deterring um fights other uh, misconduct uh, that may lead to further law enforcement um, involvement uh, with that kid or that family. Um, and so that was a bit, that, that was my question for you. And then um, on this related note, uh, Sheriff Brandingham, our um, uh, officer Brandingham, um, the SR current SRO and other police officers, I, I, uh, uh, responded to an unfortunate event and and uh, from my observations i thought they did an outstanding job so if you could pass that on to those officers uh, it was it's appreciated thank you sir uh my county sheriff brad pope for the record and uh, chief deputy Brandingham's on zoom so oh. he heard that and uh, i'm sure he appreciates it uh as far as the burnout on the sro uh, we've been working with uh, mr workman and workman and uh, mr logan to add a part-time SRO in conjunction with the uh, one SRO we have uh, in Fernley already. So they said that they had secured the funding uh, for possible part-time and maybe a full-time second SRO in the Fernley area. And we're looking at um, the school school year 24-25 at possibly implementing that position uh, because they're, the Fernley schools are, there are so many and, and uh, a lot of issues in those schools. So uh, that is something we're looking at next school year. So next August, we get a deputy back from the academy that uh, wants to take on the full-time SRO position of Fernley. Uh, our staffing levels should be much higher than they were last year in Fernley. Some points over the last year, we were down to seven deputies in Fernley. Uh, we're getting up to 16 to 18 right now. So uh, staffing levels are increasing and, and that is definitely an option that we're looking at. Right on, and I am glad to hear the Lyon County School District is planning on flipping a large part of that bill, as I believe they should. So, thank you. Yeah, both agencies are being proactive on on that exact question. Thank you. Okay. Right, anything further? With that, any uh, public? Any oh, public sorry. On this? Thank you. Seeing none, then I'll look for the motion. With that, uh, thank you, Chairman Hockaday. I'll make a motion that we approve 12E as presented. Okay. Second. Motion by Commissioner Jacobson and a second by Commissioner Keller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes for 12E, 5-0.
And we are going to move down to 12J for possible action. Approve a, re a renewal of right-of-way between Lyon County and Bureau of Land Management for the Raw Peak communication site with a term termination date of December 31st, 2054. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we proceed, I'd like to ask the DA if we could actually hear all three of these together. JK and L, because they're basically the same item, just different sites. I can answer that. You can combine items to discuss. We would have to take just vote separately. Even though they're on the consent agenda? Uh, they were pulled out. Okay. Consent. All right. So, yeah, go, go ahead and read them and then we'll okay. vote on the mm -hmm. uh, Okay. So, we're going to go under 12K for possible action. Approve a renewal of right of way between Lyon County and Bureau of Land Management for the Eagle Ridge communication site with the termination date of December 31st, 20, 2054. Well, L for possible action. Approve a renewal of right of way between Lyon County and Bureau of Land Management for the Singazi. Peak communication site with a termination date of December 31st, 2054. And okay. th thank you, ahead. Mr. Chair. So, excuse me, Mr. Chair, did you read in 12J2 or? Yeah. Okay. That was first. He did, Rob, he did that first. I did that first. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> just, just one, one simple question for all three of these. Are these sites include planning to be included in our county lands bill? Yes. Only question I had. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other commissioner comments on that? Any public comment on those? And I think we've got to vote for each one of them just separately. So uh, I'm going to look for a motion for 12J. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve a renewal of right of way between Lyon County and the Bureau of Land Management for the Raw Peak communication site with a termination date of December 31st, 2054. I have a second? Second. second. All right. Motion by Commissioner Henderson and a second by Commissioner Hendricks. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Uh, we'll move on to 12K. Uh, this one, looking for a motion to approve for uh, Eagle Ridge communication site termination date. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve a renewal of right of way between Lyon County and Bureau of Land Management for the Eagle Ridge communication site with a termination date of December 31st, 2054. Second on that. Second. All right. Motion by Commissioner Henderson. Second by Commissioner Hendricks. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. And we'll go 12-L for uh, Singatsu Peak. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve a renewal of the right-of-way between Lyon County and Bureau of Land Management for the Singatsu Part peak communication site with a termination date of December 31st, 2054. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Same thing. We've got a uh, uh, motion by Commissioner Henderson, second by Commissioner Hendricks. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Okay. Let's move on here to human services for possible action except grant award from the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services for. FY 2024, in the amount of $88,442 with no county match required for the newly developed Lyon County Resilient Families Program and create a new senior case management position reporting to the Behavioral Health Coordinator. Any commissioner comments on that? Any public comment? Um, Ms. Holmes, do you have a Anything that you want to give a report on that? Nope. We're just really excited to be receiving this funding from the Account for Resilient Nevada. And it is anticipated to be for three years. So this initial award is for uh, the remainder of this fiscal year. So it's through June. And then we anticipate it being renewed for the next two and a half years. So um, that's why we feel very confident adding a position to support this new program. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Hockaday. Yes, Commissioner Jacobson. Thank you, Chairman Hockaday. Um, Ms. Holmes, always a little nerve-wracking to approve people on soft grant money. Um, so will somebody in-house be taking this position and leaving a position vacant, or are we hiring some, do you have someone that's going to take this on knowing that 
it may be a rest of this year or possibly ending in three years. So we're having to create a new position. Unfortunately, we attempted to make it when we initially wrote this grant, we were wanting to um, use existing staff, but there was some pushback from the state in regards to supplanting and um, their beliefs on that. So we had to create a position to make it work. Um, we believe that with the work that this position will be doing and with us getting started on Medicaid billing and the state also believes that it could be sustainable through that over the next few years, we will see. Um, but the majority of the work will be Medicaid billable for individuals that are on Medicaid, although that is not an eligibility requirement for any of our programs. So it's still necessary to be able to serve folks that aren't on Medicaid. And we do believe that we'll be able to make this program continue to work post those three years. Um, but we know we have funding secured for the first three. Right, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may. so. Um, the grant won't work. Like I, I believe the acronym is what TOSA, uh, or temporary assignment. Um, would it still work there? Or I, I understand the supplanting thing, and um, but I'm just wanting to protect you down the road so that there aren't some hard feelings with an employee that may be out of luck. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that entirely. We do have a couple other funding streams that we anticipate starting soon that will be um, not time related. So we are in strong belief that we're going to have additional funding coming into the department to continue to support this position and others. Um, but no, it's not a temporary work assignment. It would be permanent. And um, and all of our all of our employees are hired on with the clause that they are grant funded. Um, but we work diligently to make sure that we continue to receive grant funding and continue to find new opportunities as other grants die, new ones begin. So we don't anticipate having to lose this position after three years, but um, but that's always a possibility, I suppose, with any of our positions that are fully grant funded, which is the majority of them. Right. And, and just finally, um, my comments weren't meant to be negative in any way. I just was concerned about that but um and just want to finish my uh little bit here with uh just congratulating you once again going out and getting eighty eight thousand four hundred forty two dollars the amount of money you bring in to our to lyon county is really remarkable and i just want to say great job once again miss holmes thank you no i totally understand your questioning as well it's something that we grapple with before we come forward with making these requests and we always want to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable long term. So I appreciate the conversation. Oh, okay. County manager. Andrew Haskin, line county manager. Actually, I think uh, Director Holmes answered pretty much what I was going to say. I mean, that a, a lot of the human services department is grant funded, and a lot of those positions are created um, with that understanding. So uh, th this would be number. Anything further? Okay, after that, do we have any public comment on that? Okay, if not, we'll take a motion for 13A. Chairman Hockadale, make a motion to accept the grant award from the Department of Health and Human Services for the fiscal year 2024 in the amount of $88,442 with no county match required for the newly, newly developed Lyon County Resilient Families program and create a new senior case management position for uh, reporting to the uh, behavior, behavioral health coordinator. Excuse okay. me. Second. All right. Motion by Commissioner Jacobson and second by Commissioner Henderson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Move on to the next page. 14A. For possible action, accept the Federal Emergency Management Agency Public Assistance Disaster 4708 Award from the Nevada Office of the Military Divisions of Emergency Management for Project Number 723959, Emergency Protective Measures Costs that occurred between March 8th to the 8th, March 8th to March 19th, 2023, in the amount of $85,302.85 
with a county match of $21,325.71 and to authorize the emergency manager to sign the grant award. Good morning, Taylor Allison, Lyon County Emergency Manager. That's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, the county manager asked me to provide a brief status update on where we are with receiving um, federal reimbursements from our um, significant flood events last year. So in my staff report that was included in your packet, you can go to the next one. Just wanted to give a quick um, overview of where we landed last year. Um, we had three significant flood events across the county between January and July of 2023. Um, the first one, Atmospheric River One, um, did not meet the minimum damage threshold for a um, federal declaration, so we did not receive public assistance. We did not receive individual assistance. Um, the damages that occurred in Wilson Canyon on 208, that was all funded out of federal highway funds. Um, the state is able to access um, as part of that recovery. So um, we will not be receiving any reimbursement for that one. The second one, that Atmospheric River 2 event, AR2 as we call it, in the EM world, um, that one did receive a federal declaration uh, for all of the costs and damages that occurred between March 8th and 19th of 23. So we received public assistance for all governmental um, facilities damaged, including roads, parks, um, all of our emergency protective measure costs. We also received a Small Business Administration Rural Disaster Loan um, Declaration and I brought some of those numbers. So um, my office assisted with six applications being submitted to SBA. Um, four of those were individual homeowners and two businesses. And two of those were approved in for the total amount of $81,300 to two private homeowners. So um, this was new where individual homeowners were eligible for SBA and we helped push the information out there. Um, the total damages just for Lyon County was a little over a million dollars. Um, we're still scoping those costs, but that's what we're at so far. And then again, for spring thaw, which was the major riverine flooding that occurred between April and July of 23, we also did not meet the damage thresh thresholds for public assistance and individual assistance. And I just wanted to note for the record, too, that the state of Nevada has never received an individual assistance declaration for private property owners, unfortunately. So just a quick reminder of the process. In order for us to get, get any reimbursement, Lyon County has to meet the minimum damage threshold of a little over $272,000. And we have to meet the statewide threshold collectively, um, which is $5.7 million and some change. Ideally, when we're assessing the costs, you're over that because as FEMA goes through the process, they're going to cut back, you know, eligible projects. And so we shoot for above that and hope to land somewhere near that to meet the minimum. And then a series of local, state, and federal assessments are done on all of our damage sites to make sure that they're eligible. So the one we're bringing forward today is our first project that's gone through the entire process almost exactly a year later, which is incredible that it takes that long. Um, emergency protective measures, the best available cost is $85,302.85. Federal cost share for this declaration, 75% um, of the costs that were incurred. So $63,977.14 have been obligated to the state of Nevada for us to draw down um, based on the amount that was already spent. We do have five other projects in the queue, including roads in both the no northern part and southern part of the county, culverts, and our parks. Um, they're all pending environmental and historic preservation review right now, and we hope to get them in the final stages. Um, I just got noticed yesterday that our parks damages, that just moved to the final stages. So I anticipate bringing that back to the board here shortly as it gets obligated to the state. And then management costs is brand new in 2023. FEMA changed the rules where we're allowed to seek reimbursement on all the management costs it takes to submit these applications. 
So I've been working with the comptroller's office and pulling that together. Um, shout out to Billy who has spent hours compiling all the costs of the damages to get um, get these applications submitted. Um, comptroller's office has done a ton of work in this area and I just couldn't have done it without them. So give them a great shout. And um, again, that first project is the one we're here today to sign this award for approval. And I'll take any questions. Questions, Commissioner Jacobson? <laughs> I don't know if I have a question per se, Chairman Hockaday, but it's a little uh, governmental, if you will, that we didn't meet the minimum threshold on these, thanks to all the work that mm -hmm. the county employees, Perry and Sons, and everyone did. The damage would have far exceeded millions upon millions had it not. And so... They would ra they will pay us for doing nothing, and not pay us for doing all the your the county crews and Perry and Son. It is such a backward system. It almost encourage uh, uh, doesn't encourage mm -hmm. lack of effort. And but my goodness gracious, what a uh, once again we're very grateful to to all the county employees that put in those numerous overtime hours and the stress and and obviously Perry and Sons for stepping up with material and and equipment um and manpower but I just cannot believe that they FEMA won't recognize the efforts went into to preventing from this natural event then so that was my comment there and then um in that it says uh, we're receiving eighty five thousand um, county match of twenty one thousand. Is that twenty one thousand money that we've already spent, or is that, I guess? Correct. So these are almost actual costs of labor, equipment, and material that were utilized. Um, so we already spent the twenty one thousand. Right, okay, our, that's all I had. Our sandbag locations, placing sandbags, road closure signs, right. and debris removal. So that's all encompassed under that umbrella. All right. Thank you so much for the report. Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question. It says that we're going to get get a, a match in the amount of eighty five thousand three hundred two eighty five, which is the best available cost. But then it says the federal share is only sixty three nine seventy seven. Does the state make up that difference? So they they cover seventy five percent as part of the declaration. In the past, there has been an opportunity to seek another 12.5% of the 25% the county is left with through the state um, disaster recovery fund. And that will all be applied for as part of this process. However, that process takes even longer than the FEMA process. And when I first started, we were still seeking reimbursement from the 2017 flooding um, so based on the state authority process. So we will pursue it. However, realistic expectations is we won't see that. Um, so we're really not getting the 85,000. Mm -hmm. We're really only getting 63,000. Correct. Okay. And for all of these, um, they're all pending review, but that's why I wanted to bring it forward to give you an idea of what stand. Well, I'm just confused with the way the agenda item is written, but okay. Anything further? Um, when we're calculating all this, I know that all these emergency areas that we were driving to and looking at, do we calculate additional mileage, fuel consumption? Do we add all that in as our total cost? Uh, because I know just about every county truck was at the floods in Smith Valley and up in uh, Dayton. And so that's an awful lot of uh, expense to get our personnel back and forth, especially, you know, Andrew was at all of them. You were at all of them. Uh, Dustin was at all of them. Uh, do we include all of that type of expense? That is included. So okay. um, with our personnel costs, we included our equipment and that was each individual, you know, road staff, duty vehicle, um, county vehicle. And it, it all goes off of those FEMA reimbursement rates. Okay. Just want to make sure we're putting everything in we possibly can so we get above the minimum. All right. Thank you very much. Any public comments on that? Anything further? 
So uh, I need a motion to accept the, the meager amount. I have a motion on that. I move motion. that we accept the Federal Emergency Management Agency Public Assistance Disaster 4708 award from the Nevada Office of the Military Division of Emergency Management for project number 723959, emergency protective measures costs that occurred between March 8th and 19th, 2023 in the amount of $85,302.85 with a county match of $21,325.71 and to authorize the emergency man manager to sign the grant award. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Hendricks and a second by Commissioner Keller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. And we're going to take a break. Yep, I was going to do that. Uh, <laughs> we'll go till uh let's take let's take 10 minutes. All right. Reconvene. It's uh 11 minutes after 10. Let's move on. Uh, county manager item 15 15a for possible action report and update the mound house community center and to provide direction to staff all right andrew haskin line county manager so i prepared a, a brief presentation just to kind of talk about where we're at and kind of what the proposal would be um, if we were to do something on the mound house community center uh, we did a little code analysis. There was a staff report attached uh, with the um, with your packet that goes over um, kind of some of the requirements based on code. Codes. So with that, I'll kind of go through the first part of this pretty quick because we just had a presentation on a zone change here. Uh, I think it was last meeting, um, but and, I, and I'm sure the board's already pretty familiar with the location, but I just wanted to run through this real quick. Yeah. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side where the site is off Red Rock, Red Rock Road. Um, it's adjacent to the park there. Um, and so it's the, the building that's highlighted there in green on the right-hand side. Uh, here's a view, the view of the front of the building looking east from Red Rock Road. And here is an aerial view um, showing the site layout of the building. Um, this is important kind of as we're talking about parking and, and that type of thing and uh, proposed use moving forward. So the proposed modifications to the building would be to remodel approximately 1800 square feet of uh, the uh, structure and uh, leave the, exist the remaining 2200 square feet uh, of, uh, as warehouse and garage space uh, available for Lyon County as you so, um, Lyon County currently needs a place to store our uh, parks and facilities trailers, uh, um, especially during the winter time. And so um, we would propose to use uh, about half of that space, a little over half of that space for that use. So, um, the front 1800 square feet, uh, um, let's just show the current layout, currently has a meeting room, two restrooms, a storage area, and then the, the rest of it is is all that garage space there. That little blue bar down there at the bottom uh, represents the fire risers that are in the in the building currently. Um, those would have to remain in place. Uh, there was some discussion at one point uh, whether or not we could remove the fire suppression system, but um, that's not a possibility given the current codes. So, so um, that would have to be retained. Um, so anyway, as a part of the opera funding, um, we have remodeled that meeting room there and we've made some changes to the restrooms to make them more ADA compliant. I believe they are ADA compliant now. Um, and we've done a number of other things. We replaced the HVAC for, um, for that area, the meeting room and the restrooms. Um, so those are all uh, heated now as well. So the proposed change uh, would be something like this uh, with a large meeting and multi-purpose room. We'd have to build a wall and a hallway there, a wall across the back. And by the way, this is not drawn to scale at all. I literally made this in PowerPoint yesterday. Um, so I do apologize. But uh, the red lines would represent new walls. Uh, 
And then the, um, so we'd build a wall around the fire riser. So that's not out, out in the open. We would build a wall across the back, separating it from the space that the county would remain or would retain for garage and warehouse space. And then um, the hallway in between the two. Uh, in addition, and it didn't show that doesn't show that on here, but there are two roll up doors on the front of the building. If we were to go with something like this, we would need to take those roll up doors out uh, and redesign basically the front of the building with either like some kind of glass storefront or re or put in a wall there um, to eliminate those doors and put in a walk in door man door uh, into that hallway area. I believe the, the current door on the front of the building goes into that small meeting room. It's been a while since I've been over there. So, um, and then there's another uh, man door just uh, in front of that fire visor area there. So we took a look at uh, occupancy current and it proposed uh, occupancy loads. Uh, um, if we were to move forward with some kind of project, uh, um, the um, current load, if you calculate it all out, uh, the building can hold about 60 people um, based on how uh, the code works. Uh, all right. Um, so occupancy loads are not just based on the space that you have available, but also HVAC systems, uh, entry and exit points for emergency situations and that type of thing, the type and number of fire sprinklers that you have all that it, it's a little bit more complicated than you know the building can hold x amount of people um the proposed would change that um to about 144 with the, the front half being about 120 and then 22 for the occupancy load of the garage and warehouse space there if we were to go with something like this uh, um, with the 144 load, we would not have to add additional bathrooms, uh, which is, I think is a key thing because you add a lot of cost with a project like that when you've got to cut concrete to put in additional plumbing. And, um, you know, again, everything has to be ADA compliant. Um, so you, it, you run into a significant, significant cost there if we have to add bathrooms. <laughs> Um, we also did an analysis on the parking, and so um, with the proposed uh, use, we would require 12 parking spaces out front um, and two uh, ADA accessible stalls. There is a cement slab in front of the building currently that could be striped uh, um, and used for ADA parking. Um, and uh, then it would also require eight parking spaces, excuse me. Uh, for the warehouse and garage. Uh, um, so I, I get that, that that may seem like a lot, but that is what the code would require. Um, so you're looking at a total of 20 regular parking spaces and then two, um, two ADA compliant parking spaces. So, so uh, here's a list of other modifications that will need to be completed on the building per uh, building codes. And, so I uh, already talked about the van accessible parking space, the front roll of doors, we talked about that. All the exit lighting and hardware would have to be replaced um, and upgraded for the new occupancy load. Um, you'd have to have a current HVAC, uh, or either the current HVAC would have to be modified or a new system would have to be put in place. Currently it's got the um, heater hanging from the ceiling. Um, I believe that would likely have to be replaced um, and with something new. Um, you could probably use a system like that for the back warehousing portion, but the front portion, um, because you'd have drop ceilings and, and things like that, would need to be uh, would need to be replaced. Uh, sprinkler heads would have to be relocated, and central line fire, of course, would have to approve that. And then um, something I wanted to point out there um, is that if we were to increase, uh, this basically if we were to use the back half of the building, that would increase the load over the point. Uh, where we would need to have um, enough more bathrooms. And um, it wouldn't, I don't believe it would be just one. Um, I think you'd have to have two, you'd have to have, uh, depending on how they were configured. Yeah. So, um, because you have to have male and female bathrooms. So, so, um, so when we 
we talked when we originally got the ARPA funding for this project uh, before um, we worked with an architect uh, to put together kind of a conceptual plan and to put together information on how much it would cost <laughs> to redo this building. And that came back at about $600,000, which we actually estimate would probably be more than that at this point, but just because costs have continued to rise. Um, and so this year with our community project request, uh, pro project funding requests through Congress, I did go ahead and include $700,000 in that those requests for the Mountain House Community Center. Uh, whether or not we will get that, uh, I I do not know. Um, that that is months off. Um, it, it'll take quite a while, as you know. We just found out about uh, uh, our request for last year, so um, it could be some time before we we will know on that. But I did want to let the board know that that was included. In that. Um, so the other options to potentially fund a project uh, would be to add it to the capital improvements plan and prioritize it against the other projects that Lyon County has. Um, that, that's typically how we do capital projects. Uh, they get added to that plan. And then as funding becomes available, we work our way down the list. Uh, um, the, another option could be, and I, and I have it a question mark there, could be potentially to create a general improvement district to, to pay for it. Now that's not without some um, challenges. So one, a GID would be, so first off, we have to do some more research and make sure that that would be a legal use for a GID. Um, I, I think it is, you know, we, we've done some preliminary research, think it could be possible, but we would have to sit down with the district attorney's office and, and really dive into that and see how that would work. Um, but at that point, uh, it wouldn't be a Lyon County facility, it would be a facility of the general improvement district. Uh, which would have to have its own separate board. And um, that means that, uh, you know, Lyon County uses wouldn't necessarily just be allowed to use it. We would have to contract with the, the GID to make that happen. So there's definitely some concern. There. Um, but that would, you know, if, if a GID was created, basically a, um, a, a new tax would be created on the property taxes of, uh, Mound House, and that money would then be used to pay for a community center. And then finally, um, <clears throat> option the last option is bonding for the project, uh, basically borrowing money. Um, that option has a, a lot of challenges, um, and cost being the biggest one. Um, you have when anytime you go out to bond, there's a bunch of legal documents and other fees that you have to pay. So you can plan on adding about 10% or more to that before you even start paying interest on it, which you also have to do. Um, so, and then that, that bond is paid back over a period of 15, 20 years. Uh, um, and so that would have to be something that, um, you know, if we went down that road, there there are some some major downsides to it, and that's certainly not my recommendation. So, uh, my recommendation, if the board decides to prioritize this project and move forward with it, uh, would be to add it to the capital improvement plan, um, and uh, then take a look at it and see how it stacks up against all the other projects uh, that Lyon County uh, has in the works. Uh, As your county manager, I, um, you know, this is a tough one. So I don't, I, you know, I certainly don't have anything against Mound House having a community center, but I do question whether or not uh, it is our top priority as a county. Um, we've got a lot of other projects that I think need to get done that are, um, that have a that need to get done in, before something like a Mount House Community Center. Um, an example could be the second bridge in Dayton or the various stormwater projects that we have throughout Lyon County. And so um, you know, if we were to, to move forward with something, this would be the 
the direction and then take a look at where that stacks up against types of projects. So that is the end of my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I apologize for how long this may take, <laughs> but I have a lot of issues with this. So I'm going to start with a little history on this before we get to the staff report, which I also have problems with. Um, approximately 50 years ago, we promised the people of Mount House, the community, sir. And we've given them money, we've taken the money back, we've given them money, we've taken the money back. We even had land donated by a family in Mount House specifically for the use to put a community center there. So, okay, we didn't make those promises. There were people in the past, but in 2022, at least three members sitting on, up here on this board now made a $1 million promise to Mount House that we were going to fund their community center, fund their community center. Then uh, a couple of meetings later, we had to claw back $700,000 of that because on the advice of the controller, we didn't really have the money. And I kind of blamed that decision on the fact that the chair at the time really lost control of that meeting and allowed a member of the uh, the audience to distract Mr. Foley while we were actually getting to the to the votes. So at, at, at the original part, we were going to use that money to build a community center sometime in the future on the land that had been donated for that purpose. But then it came up to, hey, I, I don't know where the idea came from. I don't know if it was a county idea. I don't know if it came from Central Wayne County Fire Protection District. To, hey, let's swap that land for an existing building that we can use and have a community center established quicker. To, to actually swap the land, we had to get the permission of the family that donated that land to Lyon County in the first place. So they did that basically on the assumption that we were going to put the community center in, in what was a fire station. So then this year, we clawed back the, the other $250,000 that we had allocated to Mount House for their community center leaving them with a whopping 5% of the $1 million that we allocated in 2022. Then we also just did the zoning change. Now, this is the first public hearing of a plan to split the building and not use it entirely for a community center. You know, all the actions that this board has taken up to this point regarding this property, the agenda item said community center. So I kind of question whether we can even consider splitting the building without, you know, is it possible or is it legal without bringing it back to the board? I don't know. Now, when we, when we um, got the land, when we authorized the purchase of land in, in traditions, that was for a Dayton government center. So that automatically applies more than one use. But the, but the actions that we took on this building were strictly community center. Um, I want to talk about financing it because bonds, yeah, there's a cost of bonds, but you know, we wait the cost of bonds to the increase in construction costs as we wait and wait and wait and wait for how many years before this is enough of a priority for the county to actually fulfill a promise 50 years in the making. So I think we need to look at that. Or the, you know, Silver City, the, the community center in Silver City, they have a committee that pretty much runs that building, um, as does the one in downtown Dayton, the community center there. I'd like to see those agreements. Can we do something like that? A 501c3. Can we lease the building to someone else? What fundraising possible is out there? You know, can we use PILT money for this? Can we dedicate, I mean, can we dedicate PILT to this? Or another question is, you know, the, the brothel taxes that we get, those are going to vehicle acquisition fund to buy sheriff's vehicles to reach all over the county, even though all those funds are generated in Mount House. Um, County manager, you know, say, you know, other priorities might be the second bridge or the or the um, storm sewers, which other funding might be a little for that. But that would be another 50 years before we build the community center for Mount House. So we're going to deny a promise for them for 100 years. Um, I, I, I need, we, we need more information on this item. So I'm going to request for it to come back. But I want to talk about the staff report for a second. Um, the existing county owned facility. If 56 Red Rock Road in Mount House is under consideration to be converted, it's not under consideration. This board has declared that, that building is going to be a community center. It's not under consideration. 
And then it says, this development includes a 4,000 square foot fire station building. No, it is a 4,000 square foot building that used to be a fire station. It has not been a fire station since we took ownership of that property. So there's just some misinformation sprinkled in this. So what I would like to do, um, and of course, input, but let me get this. I would like, to, well, I'll let everybody else go, and then I will, I will form a motion to direct staff to come back with some with some more information on this. What what more information would you like? I want to know what the cost of the bonds would be. I want to know what we could do to form a 501 C C three. Look at the leases between Silver City and and Dayton. I mean, I can answer some of that. Now I want to see the paperwork. Okay. I don't want your word for it. Not that I don't trust you. Uh, I want data. I want documents. This board approved those lease agreements just in the last year. I would like to see them, and I'd like to discuss the pilt, and 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 can and can Mountain House community do some fundraising and then donate those. How can we set that up? We need to get this done. Okay, when when before we traded this, there, the the Mount House Community Center met in what is now the like the kitchen or whatever, but when they had other community events like oh cookies with santa or fourth of july barbecue or something the fire protection district would move their their the equipment out of the bays and let the community use it and now we're telling them they can't even use that all they can use is this little room i can answer why why if you'd like to know i would because uh, i got a complaint from melinda cash that it was cold in there or hot in there whatever the case may be and then we had to be, we looked at it and said, yeah, you're right. The HVAC is not set up for that use. Uh, so we that, that's restricted the use of that space. Got a couple of months out of the year. I'm just, that's, that is why but, it's but, not but, set up for that occupancy. But it's been used for that in the past. Yeah. You know, what, what we have done by trading for this building is in, in a result, given the Mount House community less space than they had before. And that's not right. We need to do something about this. We need to find a way to fund it and find a way to get it where they can use the building for the community center that we, at least three of us on this board, promised them. So that's the information I went back. Commissioner Keller. So, yeah, this did open up a lot more uh, questions than it did answers to me because I there's a lot of, I can see a lot of all, all four of the reasons that were there i could be against all of them or i could be kind of for them uh it just opened up a lot more to me thank you for bringing it forward i know that you're pretty busy with all the other stuff that we've been trying to accomplish um and uh i, I just wanted to make a statement that uh i didn't none this is all new to me i, I wasn't on the board 30 years ago or anything else and so it's all new to me i'm looking at everything that's coming before us I look at uh, GIDs that we end up being the GID board of, you know, because they fail. Uh, mm -hmm. I just don't have enough information. So I'm not in a hurry to make the wrong decision. So I need you to take your time to make sure you give us all the information. I don't, I, I'm not saying that this is needed tomorrow because I want to make the right decision. Thank you. Cool. Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Keller. You reminded me of something that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, the idea of a GID, um, yeah, I understand it, but I'm kind of against it because now we're telling Mount House, okay, we're going to finally fulfill our promise to you for 50 years ago, but you got to pay for it. We're not going to do it. And yeah. Yeah. And that was just, you had requested a, a list of funding options. So yeah, that's what we did. Thank you. I'd like to hear the public comment first. Okay. All right. Um, public comment. We will uh, move into that. I see Melinda Cash has her hand raised. And you are unmuted. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to bring up one point or a couple points to you. Uh, I don't know if you're aware or not, but with everything going on with the safety with Highway 50 right now, it's generating a lot of community activity. At our last meeting, we had over 100 people attend the meeting. Thankfully, we did have the meeting area 
uh, that we could set up over 100 chairs to easily accommodate all the public. Uh, this is something that is not going to be going away anytime soon. There is activity that's going to be taking uh, place on Highway 50 to address the safety issues. I fully anticipate a very active public coming to our meetings. Now, I'm thankful we have a space big enough because obviously 400 square foot feet would not accommodate 100 people. However, uh, we have a couple issues with that space. Uh, no, I don't think I really complained about the heating. It's, it's not adequate, but we were just talking about future development that we would need a better uh, HVAC system, you know, to accommodate the meeting room. Uh, maybe that was misinterpreted. I don't know. But the concerns I do have, and this was brought to my attention by uh, the member of our public who also is a volunteer fire department person, is that we don't have proper ingress and egress to provide for the safety of the public to attend those meetings. And it was my understanding we should have exit signs on those doors and we should also have panic hardware. Now, at the very least, we probably need to at least remove one of those firehouse doors, put in a proper ingress and egress you know, entry and exit system with the proper safety factors. I can't control how many people come to our advisory board meeting, but I do have to accommodate them if they come, and I do have to provide for their safety. That's something that, you know, you require of me and I have to, I have to do. Uh, so, you know, we do need to look at, there, there are some issues that need to be done now. They really can't wait. I understand there could be a potential of $20,000 still left over from that $50,000 you originally gave us that should be enough to at least address removing one of those garage doors and addressing the safety issue of that room. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what else I can say other than the fact that I really believe we're going to continue to have a very strong presence until this Highway 50 safety issue is resolved. Thank you. Any other, any other public comment? Yes. There's no pen to sign. Uh, hi, Judith Harker from Wellington. Um, I have gone to a, a, a advisory board meeting at Mound House. And um, there were two things that I wanted to uh, bring up. Number one, um, meeting rooms like this usually have some sort of kitchen facilities and nothing was mentioned about that in your report. So I wanted to find out if there was gonna be any um, increase or a provision for kitchen facilities in that building. Cause it, it should, that's kind of, that's kind of a minimum requirement for meeting room, um, you know, just to have a microwave, a little mini fridge and a sink so people can have some refreshments for any of the events. Um, and um, regarding the 501c3 idea, Smith Valley Community Hall is entirely funded by a 501c3. Our hall board um, has a huge fundraiser every year, a big rummage sale. At, to fund it, plus they also charge um, rental fees for for groups that want to um, have events in that building, and um, you know they waive it for some some things like, you know, a local resident has a big funeral and they want to have a family wants to rent the hall that would do, reduce a fee for that, but that's all adjustable. So there there's another option that you can you can um, have for that, but um, I'm just really. Um, I really feel for my mound house friends that they, you know, they've been, you know, the long lost stepchild for so long with this community center. They really deserve something better than what they've got. And I really want to see a halfway decent kitchen um, provided for in that building too, so that the community can, community can, can really enjoy that event. I mean, even in the libraries, there's some sort of kitchen facilities in, in the meeting rooms there. So we're standing with you, Melinda. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Homestead. Doug Homestead, facility director for record. We did just finish their kitchen mm -hmm. uh, in the thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful kitchen. I'm willing to attest to that. Uh, beautiful cabinets, refrigerator. It's set up for a, it's not there. None of our, none of our community centers have ranges and stuff. Because then we have to have the fire hoods and all that, go through all that for me. So uh, we put microwaves in there, full refrigerator, sinks, and all that. It's in there. We've repainted the meeting room, put new LED lights in there in the ceilings, new heating system. And I still have about $29,000 left in that budget, 50000 And I got just this week, I had my guys um, check in with the door company, see what it costs to put in a, a a more store type front door for easier access for people. We're talking about moving that fence on the side where it kind of restricts parking, moving it towards the back of the building. So there's more parking alongside the building. You can get two rows of parking in there, one against the building, one against the park there. So we're looking at that to use that money to um, do some of those improvements too while we wait for what the direction you guys want to go. No. Uh, thank you. Just a comment about parking. Um, you know, we've got a park right next door to, to this facility. The little facility in downtown Dayton has absolutely zero parking. You park on the street. Uh, the, the Silver City schoolhouse has very little parking. You park on the street. So, I mean, people park on the street yeah. when, you have, when you have larger events. So. Mm -hmm. Commission Hendricks. I would like to see more detail on the cost of all this. And I, I know when we went to Washington, D.C., especially uh, Senator Rosen's office, her staff said that she really keys in on these particular projects. And it's one of the things that they really like to see be funded through the federal government. So I think that is a pretty strong option for us. They were excited about it. Um, yeah, Mr. Homestead, I know that you're, you know, the facility department is working as best they can on these things. So uh, as part of this information coming back, if we could have what it would be for some of these things to be done in house, if possible. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that you do it, but I'm just saying that as part of this information coming back. Fortunately, uh, um, it's going to cost more than hundred thousand dollars. And right. once you hit that threshold, we can't use do it for a public works project. It has to go contract it out. And then it goes into Davis Bacon wages. So that increases the cost 20%. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought $300,000, we could build a beautiful facility. And I, I'm a retired contractor. Mm -hmm. And when I started seeing the cost of that, my God, how things have changed when they see county government and they, um, Put the prices up. Well, and that's the kind of information that we need to evaluate too. I mean, when we're looking at funding something and different methods of funding, then what is that ramification for us doing it in house? And you just explained it, but it's as we're finding out, having it in writing is kind of what we need to look at. We had a nice presentation. Yeah, I can send my guys over there, make them do it. Yeah, but. No, I, I'm not saying that we're doing that. I'm just Turn saying we need yeah. so we need the information. In yeah, we just need the information. I think that's what Commissioner Henderson is saying. You know, we we need to see it in writing so that we can get our hands around it. That's all. Okay, I appreciate the input. Mm -hmm. can certainly add to it. Yeah. yeah, Commissioner Keller. So I don't know how much spare time we have in staff anyway to go out and do projects because pretty sure you're busy uh there's a lot of pros and cons on when you take it over as a government building in silver springs we had a private community center we wanted the big one moved up and it became part of a senior center and uh by combining with the senior center that's how we got the community center the community center in silver springs is actually the the little room in the side it's when everybody comes to our uh, advisory board meeting it's in the senior center it's not in the community center so it's a very small building and uh we've we've uh had to had the pros and cons with it because county is regulated by things that private industry isn't so uh i think we're getting a square peg in a round hole I'll say that 
as many times as I need to hear it. Uh, this is an old firehouse. It's not a community center. And I just need more, a lot more information. Okay. Anything further? I have one question. Oh, yeah. How many, what is the population of Mount House? So I uh, did look up that census tract. It's um, so Mount House and Silver City combined are about 1,800 people. So I think there's about 200 people that live in uh, Silver City. So, But uh, Silver City already has their own community center? So the community center in Silver City is a historic building. Um, sort of, it burned down, but, but it got rebuilt to historic standards. So, uh, it was in the schoolhouse. So, same with the community center in Dayton. It's a historic building as well. Um, so. so how many people would this particular building serve? About 1,600 likely. Uh, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just one comment on Silver City. They do have a kitchen. Okay. They do. They are the only they, one. They have a full commercial kitchen. And yeah, we were we were talking about we don't provide community centers for all our all our resident our our neighborhoods our communities. North on the Highway 50 corridor, the unincorporated area of Lyon County along Highway 50 corridor, every community has a community center except Mount House. Everyone. They have a place to have Christmas parties. They have a place to have barbecues. Mount House does not, and I'll stop there. I'm not saying I, I'm not saying that they don't deserve a community. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just no. Saying but what you're saying is there always be a higher priority. Fortunately, you know that's not my decision to make. It is the board's decision to make on the prize. Anything further from commissioners? We've had public comment. Um, I believe you wanted to make a motion on 15A. So, yep. yes, sir, Mr. Chair, I move that we direct county staff to provide us with more information on whether um, we need Board of County Commissioner um, action to do anything other than have a community center in that building. Also, financing options: how much would a bond cost us? How, you know how much you know how much would it cost to that and i would i would use a million dollars just because by the time we get this done it's going to be a million dollars i would seriously like uh some looking into cre creation of a 501c3 to manage the building or that we can lease it to and then also fundraising options and the possibility of transferring the brothel tax so that's my motion i have a second Okay, I will second that motion. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. 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 So the motion pass or uh, fails. We have um, ayes, Henderson, Hockaday, nays, uh, Hendricks, Keller, and Jacobson. I'd just like to make a comment. I would like to see Mound House have their community center, but the response we got when we brought that to Washington, D.C., I think if we're patient, we can get this funded without the county having to pay for it. Chairman Hockaday, if I may, yeah. um, the reason I voted no is uh, I th if we were to put this to uh, even just a public vote, I think the second bridge in Dayton would far override it, and I'm I'm just I I I, I don't know that uh, I can prioritize this over some of those projects. I am all for having a community center. I just with our budget the way it is, I I I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to lead on and keep making promises that I can't keep. And so my no, my nay is because of promises that I, I don't know that I can keep right now. And um, I, I'm not that guy. So thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you for the input. Commissioner Keller. I did. I went to Washington and we did present it. And so that Avenue has not been, uh, we just started the, doing these uh, trips to Washington where we're actually getting some stuff done uh again if we prioritize it then we're going to constantly be here putting something above it at this point in time 
So until we can find out the financing, find out some other stuff, I think it needs more time to more thought brought into it. So I'm just not ready to do anything yet. Chairman Hockaday, now, yeah. um, I will say that um, if the motion were to just get an idea on on what it would cost to help with putting in for monies, I am all for that. Um, but that that would be the motion um, or the direction that I would like us to see go is actually have a set number on what it would look like so that when we do ask for monies, we do ask for this. It isn't just, oh, we need a million dollars for this because they're going to probably want a more detailed plan than just a blanket one million. Commissioner Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for clarification, the motive was, was for county staff to provide us with more information. That was all. So don't want the information. That's fine. Anything further on that? And that's the way I took it was we're requesting more information in writing. Um, so I, I know the bridge is important and we're probably looking at 30 to $50 million because I think the last estimate was 15 years ago and it was maybe 20 years ago and it was 25 million, I think. Um, and so we can almost say that it's definitely doubled for that second bridge, which is definitely the priority. We've got to get a second entry exit to uh, uh, that and, area. And Mr. Chair, putting all your eggs in one basket, waiting for the county or for the federal government to maybe or maybe not give you money, I think it would be in our best interest to be looking at other options. Okay. Um, Chairman Hockett, if I may. So I guess I took the motion as the county staff providing that, but that really isn't. Uh, are they? Um, is it? Are they in a position where they can actually form an actual bid or well, get monies? Or is it just estimates? Um, I think based... just basically, like uh, Commissioner Keller said, that you know it's kind of new to him, and he wants to be able to sit down and look at the figures. What what is in the planning? And and uh, kind of that's the way I looked at it. Uh, but go ahead. No, I'm I'm fine. This is where we're at. Okay. All right. Well, and that uh, we will. I guess move on. 15B for possible action authorizing select county commissioners and county manager to attend the 2024 NACO National Association of Counties Annual Conference and Exposition in Hillsborough County, Florida, July 12th through 15th, 2024, for an approximate cost of 4000 per person. And this was requested last meeting by Commissioner Keller. So at this point, um, we're looking at selecting commissioners to go um, and authorize that expense. So uh, first thing I'd like to ask is who is interested in going to the, the NAPO National Association of Counties Conference? I'm interested, but I am also up for re-election and I do have an opponent just Okay. Um, Commissioner Henderson. I have no need to visit Florida in July. Okay. Commissioner Jacobson. Um, I would support uh, no more than two at the very most going. If I'm going to plan about prices and whatnot, I don't, I don't think we should ever send a quorum out of state. I think the quorum to the state NACO and some of those are appropriate, but uh, I will not be voting for more than two to attend this conference. That I can promise you. I would like to attend this conference, and I do want to make a statement. Uh, at these conferences, I, I understand not wanting to send a quorum, but at the same time, it's the same as going to the state meetings where we do send a quorum. This is a, a spot where, like when we go to the federal government, we sit there and try to, to bring money into the the county and i think it, we're seeing some really good results on that right now and when we go to the federal one we also look at stuff that is we get information and that's why we are doing the the webinars that we're just doing the workshops and what's coming before best practices at the state level is actually stuff that we brought from the federal level and what it's doing is is we might not be bringing money in 
but we're saving it. We will end up saving millions of dollars to our county by being prepared for the stuff that's coming down the pike to us. There was some stuff about drinking water. There's stuff about uh, the electric uh, mandates, everything else that's going to impact this county. And by having the most information, not from one or two uh, representatives from this board, but as many people that are willing to go, would want like to go, because when you show up to these conventions, seriously, we are not in the same room. It's not, I'm, I'll be gathering some things from one room, but uh, Commissioner Hendricks was in a different room, Commissioner Henderson's in a different room, and we're all, so it's like we're, we might be in the same location, but we're all gathering different information that we can bring back, and, and for the cost of going there, and the cost that we bring back or save, there's not even a comparison, it's not even a, a rounding error in the, in the funding, I mean, if you look at it, so to me, the more people that we can send that are willing to go and get information to bring back to our county, I think is very important. Uh, okay. Uh, and I'm going to, since everybody's talked, I'm going to get back to Commissioner Henderson here, but I'm going to say that I haven't made the last two, so I'm going to put my name in the hat to go. And uh, we'll get to voting on this in a minute. But uh, Commissioner Henderson. Hey, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. Um to Commissioner Jacobson's comment, I don't mind sending as many people that want to go that we, that we have the money for, because at these conferences, you are not, you're, you're not together. You don't really have a quorum. And as Commissioner Keller said, you know, the, the conquer and divide, the more people you have, the more information you, you can gather and bring back. Um, I, I would like a, a clarification. This, this money would be funded out of next year's budget. That was Andrew Huskin, Lyon County Manager. That's what I was good enough to say. And can we get Mr. Foley in here to find out what our travel budget is, is left for this year? Uh, I can answer that question. Mr. Foley is not here. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I actually just looked this up the other day. It's a little over $16,000. For the commission. This and and then, the, and then you have your own. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then you didn't get to pipe up. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody asked you, but are you interested in going to those? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will go ahead and say yes for now. If for whatever reason I can't uh, attend, that, then uh, I won't. But we can go ahead and approve it, and then, uh, I'll, yeah, I can't. Yeah. We we talked. <laughs> we had a significant discussion on that one. Um, all right. So has everybody had a chance to speak? Um, so I'm I'm kind of taking Commissioner Hendricks. You're considering staying for your election, or are you jumping in? Because I'm going to say that yes, we will take two commissioners, and we we're going to vote on that. If you plan on going, we'll have a vote. I do plan on going, but my concern is whether or not you all want to make that investment, whether or not. I'm going to be here after the end of this year. Well, we can vote and um, say I I will set up a vote here for um, each of us, and we'll go with the highest uh, votes if uh, you can do that. Um, first would be how many do we want to actually send? We have 16000 in the budget. No, 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 no. That sixteen thousand is what's left in this year's budget. This, year's budget. this money would come out of next year's budget. Okay. All right. Um, if you'd entertain a motion, I'd I'd like to make a motion. Okay, make a motion on again. Uh, we're going to like first to make, make a, a motion on the number, and then we'll make we a motion discuss. on who's going to go. That's what well. I I, I'd like to make a motion to send three people, the three people that asked to go: Tammy yeah. Hendricks, Commissioner Hendricks, Commissioner Hockaday, and Commissioner Keller and County Manager Haskins to go. And if uh, if they opt out before next year, then they can. So like it was Tammy's consideration, if she loses an election, then of course she would be opting out, but it's in July yeah. of the next budget. And she will know in the primary. Okay. So that's the motion that's made that we have sent three. Um, all those in favor for sending three. Oh, public comment. Yep. 
I uh, seeing seeing that no public comment. All right. Thank you for it reminding need, it me. It needs a did somebody second it? Uh that's why I was gonna ask for a second. Okay. And he just reminded me of public comment prior to that. So do I I have a motion by Commissioner Keller and a second by I'll second it. Commissioner Henderson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, and I'm a nay. Um, but motion passes. <clears throat> Eyes are Commissioner Hendricks, Commissioner Keller, and Commissioner Henderson. No. And no, no. How could I? How could I? You. You. I. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought it was going. <laughs> no, no. This is just for sending three. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. And, and I'm still stuck on two. So uh, I'm an I'm an A. You were an I. I was an I. All right. So the motion passes. We'll send three. And that will be uh, the three that will be going then will be myself, Commissioner Keller, and Commissioner Hendricks. And uh, Commissioner, or I should say County Manager, I won't demote him, County Manager. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, all right. That's taken care of. Move on to 16 Advisory Board. For possible action, appoint up to one member to the Mountain House Advisory Board with a term expiring December 31st, 2024. We have Heidi Marty and Crystal Wiederburn, sorry. And uh, see, Commissioner Henderson wants to make a selection here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move that we appoint Heidi Marty to the Mountain House Advisory Board with a term expiring December 31st, 2024. Second. All right. We have the motion by Commissioner Henderson and a second by Commissioner Jacobson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes 5-0. Uh, 16B for possible action appoint up to one member to the Silver City Advisory Board with a term expiring December 31st, 2025. We have one uh, application. Melissa Friend. Do I have a motion? Did you ask for public comment on the last one? Uh, no, I didn't. Thank okay. you. So um, did we have any public comment? I didn't, didn't see any hands. So, <clears throat> um, for possible action, appoint up to one member of the Silver City Advisory Board with a term expiring December 31st, 2025. Any commissioner comments on that? Any public comments on that? Any motion for that? Well, Mr. Chair, I move that we appoint Melissa Friend to the Silver City Advisory Board with a term expiring December 31st, 2025. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Henderson and a second by Commissioner Hendricks. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So now we're down at 17. Agenda requests, administrative policies and procedures. So uh, let's look at any type of agenda request for... Then the next meeting or at the future meetings, uh, Commissioner Hendricks. It was brought up at the last meeting, and I just want to bring up it again. That maybe we should consider doing a resolution showing that we don't support moving our mail distribution center out of the state. Okay. All right. So that agenda request has been noted by the county manager. Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you. Now, knowing that we still have a little bit of money left in travel budget for this year, I like an agenda item to consider sending a commissioner or two to the Western Interstate Region Conference in July, June, or June. May. May. That's coming up fast. Yes. There'll be a first of the month meeting. Yeah. Commissioner Keller. I don't have anything else to add. Nothing at this time, Chairman. Okay, and nothing for me. All right. Final commissioner comments. Nothing. Um, I don't know why anybody would want to serve on the Mountain House Advisory Board, but I appreciate the people that do, and I apologize. Commissioner Keller, Commissioner Jacobson. All right. Everybody have a great Easter, the end of the month. Um, that will take care of uh, commissioner comments. Public participation. This is the final par public participation. And I, and I know you want to jump up there. So let me finish reading this 
and no action will be taken on any item until it's properly agendized. It's anticipated the public participation will be held at this time, though it may be returned to at any time during the agenda. Citizens wishing to speak uh, during public participation are asked to state their name for the record. And also, you sign. I just saw you sign in. That's great. You'll be limited to three minutes. Go ahead. For the record, my name is George Robinson. I live on Pete Hendricks Road. Uh, I was hoping the sheriff would still be here, but to know the decoy car only works for the first trip. Once they know it's a decoy car and it's got a flat tire to boot, and their speed on a sign don't work most of the time, they say that belongs to the city, so I don't know what the hell the deal is there. It might have helped the corner, but reducing Beaton Ridge Road, Ayazi, and Miller Road down to 30 miles an hour hasn't done a damn thing to reduce traffic. The speeds are still the same way. They used to go 70, now they're going 60. I've lived there for 15, well, 19 years almost. And I've been complaining to commissioners and the sheriff, this is the third one now, that nothing's going to change until you start writing a ticket. Coming out and parking on your shoulder and doing your paperwork doesn't mean baloney. As soon as they get by, they're going back to their speed limit. Yeah. I know I travel the road and I look for the sheriff sitting there. As soon as I get by him, I go back to 50 miles an hour again. I don't even take the road coming home because it's hard to lose 30 or 35 after you've gone to 70 all the way from Carson City or 65, whatever. And I just, if they got the time to come out there and sit on the shoulder and do nothing, why can't they write a damn ticket while they're And then the word will get out. They're enforcing the speed limit. You might as well put up 15 mile an hour signs. It doesn't about as much good. So that's what I have to say, and I'm sorry he's not here to hear it. So when I can catch him, I'll get you at him there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have a closed session today? No, nope. not today. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, then we're going to go to adjournment at 11.07. Meeting is adjourned.